Hello everyone. Previously we discussed about the basic anatomy of ankle joint and foot. Now let us discuss the osteokinematics of talocrural joint. Osteokinematics means we need to learn about the movements which occurs between the bone or at the joint. It's a plane and axis at which the movement occurs and the range of motion. So the movement occurring at the talocrural joint are the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So we can discuss the osteokinematic in open kinematic chain and closed kinematic chain. So during open kinematic chain, the talus along with the foot moves on the tibia. Whereas in closed kinematic chain, the tibia moves on the talus because the foot will be fixed on the ground so these are the two differences and uh, because of these differences the arthrokinematics will be different during open kinematic chain and during closed kinematic chain this dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occurs in sagittal plane and coronal axis and the range of motion is about 20 degree of dorsiflexion and about 0 to 50 degree of plantar flexion before moving on to arthrokinematics of the talocrural joint, we have to understand the surface of the talus which articulates with the tibia is convex whereas the tibial surface which articulates with the talus is concave. Now we need to understand the concave convex rule that is when concave moves on convex surface, the sliding will be towards the same direction to the movement of the bone. And when the convex surface is moving on concave, the sliding will be in the opposite direction to the movement of the bone. Now let us discuss the arthrokinematic during open kinematic chain movement at the talocrural joint. Uh, during open kinematic chain, the talus will move on tibia. So during dorsiflexion, the talus moves superiorly or rolls superiorly and the surface of the talus slides inferiorly because the surface of the talus is convex therefore it will slide opposite to the direction of its movement during plantar flexion the talus rolls inferiorly and its surface on the tibia slides superiorly during close kinematic chain the tibia will move on talus that means the concave surface will move on convex surface so during dorsiflexion the tibia will move anteriorly and its surface also will slide anteriorly because the surface of the tibia is concave during plantar flexion the tibia will move posteriorly and its surface also will slide posteriorly Moving on to osteokinematics of the subtalar joint. The movement occurring at the subtalar joint is primarily eversion and inversion. But the inversion and eversion occurs along with the adduction and abduction of the foot. So these are the inversion and eversion at the subtalar joint which causes the foot to invert and evert. So this movement occurs in coronal plane and sagittal axis and the range of motion is about 23 degree of inversion and 12 degree of eversion. Let us understand the arthrokinematics at the subtalar joint. As we know the subtalar joint is formed between the talus and the calcaneum. We know that it is formed by attachment of the anterior, middle and posterior facets of talus and calcaneum. We also know that the posterior facet comprises of the 70 percentage of the joint and the posterior facet of the calcaneum is convex whereas the posterior facet of the talus is concave. So during closed kinematic chain talus moves on calcaneum and during open kinematic chain the calcaneum moves on talus. So let's discuss the open kinematic chain to understand the arthrokinematics of the subtalar joint. During inversion, when the calcaneum moves inward, that is medially, its surface will slide laterally because the surface of the 
calcaneum which is articulating with the talus is convex the surface which articulates is the posterior facet of the calcaneum and during eversion that is movement of the calcaneum laterally its facet surface will slide medially so you can imagine the close kinematic chain movement where talus moves on calcaneum I won't be mentioning right now because it may be confusing between the open kinematic chain and closed kinematic chain so for now we will be discussing only open kinematic chain for subtalar joint now moving on to transverse tarsal joint osteokinematics here the movement is adduction and abduction which is very minimal and it moves along with the subtalar joint inversion and eversion so this combined movement of inversion and eversion along with adduction and abduction of foot is also called as supination and pronation in some other books so the transverse tarsal joint is the joint between the uh, navicular bone and the talus and cuboid and the calcaneum the navicular bone and the talus joint is called as talo navicular joint and between the cuboid and the calcaneus is called as calcaneo cuboid joint so you can imagine during eversion uh, the first picture you can see during eversion calcaneum and the navicular bone moves laterally and during inversion the calcaneum and navicular bone moves medially now coming to arthrokinematics of the transverse tarsal joint the navicular bone will slightly spin on the head of the talus and slide laterally during eversion and during inversion it will spin on the head of the talus and slide medially during inversion coming to combined osteokinematics of the talocrural subtalar and transverse tarsal joint when the uh, talocrural joint goes for plantar flexion along with inversion at the subtalar joint and adduction at the transverse tarsal joint it is called as supination and it is called as pronation when the talocrural joint goes for dorsiflexion subtalar joint goes for eversion and transverse tarsal joint goes for abduction the next joint is the tarsal metatarsal joint which is distal to the transverse tarsal joint there is not much movement at this joint as it is firmly stabilized by the ligaments around it but there will be some movement if the transverse tarsal motion is inadequate so this tarso metatarsal joint will rotate to provide further adjustment during walking when the transverse tarsal joint is inadequate let us understand further osteokinematics at the foot there are two important topics which is supination twist pronation twist and metatarsal break so when does the supination twist occur it occurs when we are weight bearing so when we are weight bearing the foot will try to flatten on the ground there will be pronation or there will be eversion of the subtalar joint causing the lateral aspect of the foot to raise off the ground whereas the medial aspect of the foot that is forefoot will be pressed on the ground so there won't be equal surfacing of the foot on the ground therefore the supination twist will occur so what is supination twist so as i told you the hind foot pronates or everts in weight bearing position because of which the forefoot on the lateral aspect will be raised from the ground and forefoot on the medial aspect will be pressed on the ground to prevent this tarso metatarsal joint will go for slight supination so that the lateral aspect of the forefoot will touch the ground this slight adjustment at the tarso metatarsal joint will cause the plantar aspect of the foot to be in contact with the ground for this slight supination twist to occur at the tarso metatarsal joint the first and second tarso metatarsal joints should go for dorsiflexion and fourth and fifth tarso metatarsal joint should go for plantar flexion so again i would like to repeat again the supination twist during weight bearing the subtalar joint or the hind foot will go pronate 
which will cause the lateral aspect of the foot to raise off the ground and the medial aspect of the foot at the forefoot to compress at the ground. To prevent the lateral aspect of the foot to be raised, the tarso metatarsal joint here at this level, the tarso metatarsal joint will go for supination, which is called a supination twist so that the lateral aspect of the foot also touches the ground along with the medial aspect of the foot. Now just opposite to this supination twist is called as pronation twist. In pronation twist, the hind foot is locked in supination where the forefoot tends to lift off on the medial aspect that is in this aspect, the medial side of the forefoot tends to raise because of the supination at the hind foot whereas the lateral aspect of the foot will be compressed on the ground to prevent this again the tarso metatarsal joint will go for supination uh, pronation twist to counter the rotation caused by the supination of the hind foot uh, so because of this pronation twist the medial aspect of the foot also will touch the ground along with the lateral aspect of the foot so for this pronation twist to occur the first and second tarso metatarsal joint should go for plantar flexion and fourth and fifth tarso metatarsal joint should go for dorsiflexion moving on to metatarso phalangeal joint which is a condyloid synovial joint the metatarsal head is convex and the base of the proximal phalanx which connect with the metatarsal head is concave it has a 2 degree of freedom which is flexion of 0 to 30 degree and extension of 0 to 80 degree and abduction of 0 to 15 degree and adduction of 0 to 20 degree. The important point here to understand is the metatarsal break. So what is metatarsal break? You can see in the second picture for the heel to be raised metatarsophalangeal joint should go for extension and when it is extended enough it will create a break so that the heel is raised comfortably without foot being slipped so this is called as metatarsal break it is a break that occurs at the metatarsophalangeal joint as the heel raises while the metatarsal head and toe remain weight bearing so during this the metatarsophalangeal joint has to extend which occurs around the oblique axis you can see here the axis which runs from the second to fifth metatarsophalangeal heads it is about 54 to 73 degree you can see here 54 to 70 73 degree and this degree of this oblique axis is important so that the weight is distributed all over the metatarsal heads so without this uh, metatarsal break the plantar flexors cannot lift the heel completely so if uh, the metatarsophalangeal joint extension is restricted the lifting of the heel will be difficult this metatarsophalangeal joint is like a fulcrum for the heel to be lifted and for a person to propel forward during walking so as i've already mentioned the oblique orientation of the axis where the metatarsophalangeal joint extends will allow the distribution of the weight throughout the heads of the metatarsals now during extension the metatarsal will move on phalanx because it is a close kinematic chain and we know the articulating surface of the head of the metatarsal is convex therefore the convex will move on concave during extension the metatarsal head will roll anteriorly whereas its surface will slide posteriorly because its surface is convex moving on the concave surface of the phalanx coming to interphalangeal joint there is not much to discuss here it is a there are proximal and distal interphalangeal joint which are synovial hinge type of joint it has only one degree of freedom which is flexion of 0 to 50 degree and extension of 0 50 to 0 degree so we have discussed some important topics here which are supination twist pronation twist and metatarsal break so i would like you all to read through the books and understand it in depth so that it can be used in our clinical practice 
थैंक यू